in walking through some of the results that we've had, particularly on the Delphi project. So we're very, very pleased. Uh, give you all my greetings from all my faculty at Michigan State University. Uh, many of them are here today enjoying uh, the University of Wisconsin as we always do. Now, the last time I was giving a presentation at the University of Wisconsin, it was actually my dissertation, Defense, 30 years ago. So it's interesting to come back, and Norm Bourbon's in the back. He was on my committee. Uh, things have changed a great deal, obviously, in Madison and at the university. And uh, their new facilities are just incredible. We were up on the fourth floor of the university club, and very different up there. In fact, one of the things I did once was when I was defending that year back in 1986, it was just unbelievably hot that year. And we lived in Eagle Heights, and we were just dying with the heat. So I, what I ended up doing was turning the air conditioner on in the conference room in the annex and using that room. And one night, somebody locked it, and I couldn't get in there to do my work on my dissertation in nice, cool weather. And the next day that it was open, I, I put this sign up that said, don't, do not, under any conditions, lock this door, and I signed it the rehab psychology faculty. And uh, I came back like four years later. The sign was still up there. They were still leaving that unlocked for the students who needed some cool days during the summer. Um, we're going to be talking about the, uh, the, the projects that we did with the RRTC on evidence-based practice. Uh, at Michigan State, we were the uh, lead uh, partner in terms of the phase two of that very large project. Uh, and phase two really had about three components to it in terms of products. One was a comprehensive lit literature review that we did first uh, that was published. We then did a four-state sample case study that uh, Roy's going to be talking about. Uh, and that was really illuminating. We went to uh, Texas, Utah, uh, Mississippi, and then also to uh, Virginia. Uh, Paul Wayman's uh, journal, the Journal of Oak Rehab, published a special issue on that multiple case study. And then the, the last part is the Delphi. And the Delphi really was to extend and validate uh, what we have found out in the case studies and our review of literature. So we were able to, to pull together some extraordinary panelists to help us with the Delphi study. And that'll be much of what we'll talk about today. So Roy will start out, Roy Devalier, who's a graduate of our program last year, uh, he'll be starting with a kind of a review of where we are, some background information, and then kind of give you an overview of the, the results from the multiple case studies. And that will lead us then into the Delphi study. And Trent Landon, who's a current doctoral student ready to defend in three short weeks, uh, he'll, go, he'll go ahead and give us the methodology that we utilize for the study and uh, get us started, and then I'll follow up with the findings and implications and observations. So let's start out with Roy. Okay. All right, good morning. Bit of a professional disclosure before I get started. In my other life, my current other life, I'm currently a mid-level manager with Michigan Rehabilitation Services, a uh, district level site manager in Michigan of the state VR program. So when I talk about this evidence-based practice, I think I've been fortunate enough to experience and be part of the, the RRTC evidence-based team to see it on sort of a macro level and how it's done in other VR agencies throughout the country, but also see how it's filtering down to the practitioner level because it certainly is. And I'll share some of my experiences and insights with you on that th this morning. As we know, we're all here today because there is a call for evidence-based practices in terms of VR service delivery. And as Dr. Wayman mentioned earlier, we're right at that cusp, we're right at that beginning point of what are they? How do, I, how do we identify them? And we just heard Dr. Strauser and Dr. Chan talk about we have all the data, but how do we use it? How do we use those big data sets? to identify those patterns of services or service deliveries or interventions that are evidence-based that will lead to employment outcomes for our clients. Now, there are also some, some practical considerations in terms of the movement towards evidence-based practices. I know in Michigan, um, there's a hard look at return on investment. Now, other states are also considering uh, return on investment. One of the leaders in return on investment, or ROI, is West Virginia. 
our department in Michigan is taking a look at what services are we purchasing? How much? Who is providing those services? So they're pulling in, they're taking a look at those CROs, those vendors. And what are the employment outcomes? Of course, the most important outcome. What is the employment outcome for the clients of our, our agency? Of course, we all know, and it's been studied and proven empirically that rehabilitation counseling services do enhance the employment outcomes for individuals with disabilities. Although we're here today to refresh our knowledge and help the movement forward in evidence-based practices, because that's where we need to go now, and that's very obvious in what we heard this morning. Not to say that there aren't any evidence-based practices in VR service delivery. Of course, we have supported employment. We heard about that. There's also the IPS model. And of course, what Dr. Wayman mentioned earlier, that paid employment experience for that transition youth leads to later on paid employment upon transition to uh, the world of work. And as Dr. Strauser mentioned earlier, what are those patterns? How are we going to discover those patterns? What are the questions we need to know to look at those big data sets to find out what are those service patterns that we can identify that lead or improve the out employment outcomes for folks with disabilities? And lastly, as Dr. Strauser wrapped up just recently, this morning, how, what's the knowledge translation? Not only what's the knowledge translation, but more importantly, at least what I see at my level back in uh, Michigan, at the district level, how is that implemented? It's slowly turning the corner. I can recall in the day there would be a request for proposal put out to the districts. And here's the funding. And that's pretty much where it stopped. Here's the proposal, here's the funding, what are you gonna do? And that was it. Nowadays, we do have that, that process. They do put out proposals, innovative proposals for innovative projects, but it's much more sophisticated. Not only is there funding attached, what are the interventions you're going to use? Are they evidence-based? How are you going to implement this? Collaboration is also a big one. Who are you collaborating with? Is it your CIL? Is it your local community rehab organization? Who are you collaborating with and what are the outcomes? Not just employment, what, the, what are those specific outcomes that you're going to achieve under this particular program? So it is slowly turning the corner in terms of those types of proposals. Okay. As Dr. Leahy mentioned, I'm going to do a little recap of our phase two, which was the multiple case study of four VR agencies before we launch into the Delphi study. And the, first, the purpose was to identify, discover emergency, emergencing practices, a promising vocational rehabilitation service delivery that improved the employment outcomes of individuals with disabilities. It was a multi-stage or qualitative analysis where we selected four VR agencies and took a look at their data. Whoops. And in terms of the information we looked at when we went to visit these state VR agencies, we took a look at their comprehensive policies and practices. What were some of the structural elements? How were they organized? And we'll see some of that in some of the results. What were some of the structural elements that encouraged innovation best practices? How were they implemented in the field? And on a macro level, what was the culture for that? How did the top leadership encourage innovation best practices leading towards evidence-based practices in the field? And our four state sample consisted of Maryland, Mississippi, Texas, and Utah were on board for this. We took a look at their state plan, innovation unit proposals, and other relevant information, obviously their outcomes, um, and other documents that were available to us. The methodology, I think Trent will cover a little bit more of this in detail, was, was a 
semi-structured and group interviews. We wanted to capture as much input as we could, so we went, went at it interviewing three levels of employees within a particular agency. We talked to the leadership, we talked to the mid-level managers, we also talked to the VR counselors and staff using a semi-structured and a group interview process. We wanted to keep it open-ended as possible, and that really worked. They were so enthusiastic, they just could go on and on about the work they were doing in the field, how it was helping their customers, how it was helping businesses, how it was helping them enhance their relationship with the business community, getting employment for their customers, and how it was paying off for their clients. What we didn't, what we did find was when we followed up those questions, it's, well, how do you measure this? How can you show us or demonstrate that that works? there was really no response. So while there's good intentions in the field, everybody was excited and motivated to go out and do new things, innovative things for their customers, whether it be the general caseload or transition caseload, there really wasn't anything in place, i.e. outside of supported employment and benefits counseling, some very solid programs that were very measurable. Outside of that, most of them were just at the point of best practices. The research questions for the phase two study, again, were fairly broad, wide open. We wanted to capture as much data input as we could. What were the specific best practices that appear to be evidence-based and transportable? We wanted to know not only what were they doing in terms of best practices, but what programs could be copied, what programs could be transported to other agencies throughout the nation that could use and employ these strategies. The second question, what are the best models of effective practice policy and procedures that created an environment for innovation that leads to best practices and evidence-based practices? Those were our two overall research questions for the phase two. The results for the first question, there were four categories. The first category is service provision. Out of these three services, one that really stuck out for us was the benefits counseling from Maryland. Uh, Maryland intentionally set out to set up a benefits counseling program for their clients. They were struggling to have individuals, especially young people, those in transition students, who were receiving SSI, having them move into employment. That was a huge challenge for them. They undertook a very intentional effort to train individuals to be benefits counselors. They implemented the program and their results in, in terms of individuals receiving SSI going to work uh, improved dramatically. That was a standout for us. In terms of partnerships, and I think we're gonna see this, well it is, it's pretty much mandated under WIOA. We're going to have to intentionally think about what our partnerships are going to be, especially with um, the business community, that dual customer role that Dr. Wayman spoke about earlier, that's very evident. In terms of partnerships, these are uh, examples of, of, again, some very specific intentional partnerships in different states. Uh, the Choose to Work was um, a program out of Utah that focused on TANF recipients. They put effort into that. The Utah Defender was obviously the state of Utah had a long going ongoing collaboration with the Department of Corrections in that state to provide services. And in Maryland, they had a very involved seamless transition program that was paying off for them. In terms of uh, technology, some states incorporated perhaps technology or other administrative procedures to free up their counselors to do counseling work and to be out in the field. Dr. Wyman mentioned earlier, our counselors are motivated, they're knowledgeable, they want to be flexible in their, in their provision of services, but what are the resources we're going to provide to them so they can do that, they can get out in the community and make those collaborations and find employment opportunities for their clients. Certification. Uh, it was interesting in Maryland that they had a it's a very small department that actually certified community rehab partners or vendors or service providers who were perhaps not CARF certified. And it goes beyond just the certification. 
What they're really doing here was very intentional in that the certification was a large part to ensure fidelity to a particular model. And in Maryland, that model was the IPS program. And in order to provide, in order for a service vendor to participate in that program, they had to demonstrate fidelity to that model on a consistent basis, evidence-based, right? That's what they were getting at. In terms of the second uh, model, excuse me, second question, what were some of the conditions or the, what were some of the environments that we discovered in our study that led to best practices or innovation and in service delivery? This one, this incubator unit was from Texas. They had a whole unit that's all they did. They oversaw innovative projects at any level throughout the agency. It didn't have to generate from the top. It could come from the bottom. It could come from the field counselors. And that was widely encouraged how it bubbled up to the top to become a program and how it was monitored and measured through this incubator unit. Uh, technology, at the time, this was about four years ago, I think, you know, but SharePoint was coming on the scene, but I think SharePoint's pretty much an old technology at this point. But that was huge in Texas. It allowed them to post data, comments, recommendations throughout the state. Anybody in, in the state VR system in Texas could access this, and a lot of sites would go there, a lot of different districts, if we would call them that, could go there and they could actually steal programs, and they were very proud of that. If it was working here in, in this part of Texas, maybe it'll work here. So you didn't have to reinvent the wheel. You could take what was out there and make it fit your locale. Um, again, data-driven, what's the data say? in terms of that program, how successful was it, or if it wasn't successful, perhaps why, and here's how we can improve on that. In terms of, again, that environment for innovation and best practices, the dual customer approach was big, especially in Texas that focus on the business community, that local employer. Counselors were highly encouraged to go out and develop those relationships with local employers. Okay, and we see that in WIOA as well. One of the outcome measurements for WIOA is going to be, what are those services that are provided to businesses? And how are you going to demonstrate that collaboration, that dual customer approach? That E3 is from Texas, and they're saying was excellent service every time for every customer. And that was their motto, and that was permeated throughout the, the uh, agency. They were really, Texas, and as well as the other states, were really big on that collaboration with the business community. Staffing, the four states we looked at had specialized caseloads and or specialized counselors associated with that. Perhaps a counselor received special training in deaf and hard of hearing. It could be supported employment caseload or it could be a, another specialized caseload that needed attention and was addressed through staffing and training. Training in clinical and organizational skills enhancement. That was very evident in Utah. When uh, the team went to Utah, it was discovered they kind of backed off as the VR counselor being solely in that case management role. They backed off and went back to rehabilitation counseling routes and encouraged and promoted, supported the holistic approach, working with that customer in a holistic sense, kind of having folks back out of that VR process a little bit, going more holistic with the client. Service development, providing the, the tools and the resources for folks in the field to be innovative and to go forward with it. Um, and that not only was in terms of resources, but also in response to client needs. In Mississippi, they had a rapid response approach where customers, they were brought in and it was as fast as they could do it, get them through the application eligibility to service. I think it was a two week time frame. But again, it was done thoughtfully. It just wasn't let's push them through. It was this is how we do it to get that person to employment. Because as we know, the longer the person is involved in the system, the chances of employment decrease.
The next few slides are a cross analysis of the four states we looked at. And this one starts with the leadership at the top. And in each of the states, the top leadership cited the culture. They were very proud of their culture in that it, the communication was two-way. It was both up and down the chain of command, so to speak. They were very proud that they had open doors, that anybody could contact them anytime with an idea, and let's get it started. I think in Texas, they went so as, as far as to say, don't tell us about it, just go ahead and do it. Of course, keep us in the loop if you need the resources or if you run into an issue, because if you've worked in a state uh, VR system for any time, obviously there's policies and procedures, but it was go for it. That was the message from the Texas leadership. Go for it, keep us in the loop, let us know how it's going, let us know how we can support you. Uh, partnerships, as I mentioned earlier, were huge across the states, as well as some uh, business models, service integration, and, com and leadership communication was huge. At the mid-manager level, mirrored the um, leadership. Again, it was the culture. How autonomous could those local counselors, that local site or district be in delivering services? In other words, they were very happy, very excited and motivated that the reins were let loose. They were given the reins to move their district forward and structure it, structure their staffing, their services in a way that met their needs at that level to move things forward and to find employment for their clients. Partnerships uh, were also very important. Again, that collaboration piece. Maryland had a wonderful collaboration piece with um, their state mental hygiene authority, as, as they termed it, but we would call it community mental health in other places. And that was that IPS model. And it wasn't an easy thing to get started. It, According to the reports and the individuals we talked to, it took them five years to reach a collaborative agreement between VR and that mental hygiene authority in terms of how to serve individuals with severe and persistent mental illness and using braided funding to do that and how to get the individual through that in a timely manner. It took them five years to work through that. And they admitted it was tough. It was a very tough challenge, but they overcame it. And VR was able to work with them in terms of amending their policies, re-examining re their policies, as well as the mental health side. And they have a very strong IPS model uh, that is closely uh, measured and monitored through their certification process. Teamwork um, and outcome evaluation was also important uh, to the managers at the mid-level. Getting down to the practitioners, the VR counselors and staff, Culture was a big issue. The openness of leadership, the message sent from the, the leadership, the mid-managers, and on down. How was that perceived? It was perceived very positively in these four states. But the opposite was that was also true. They felt they were being heard. They knew they could bring the message up the chain of command. They knew they could contact their leaders and bring forward ideas, and they were all very proud of that. Evaluation was important. They knew they were doing or delivering services that were innovative. They were best practices. But how could they sustain that? How could they evaluate that to demonstrate the value of that particular service or program that they're working with? Um, encouraging innovation, the support for innovation. The states we looked at, the councils were very um, excited and motivated that they, again, they could take the reins and move forward as so long as they kept everybody in the, in the loop. It was all um, interesting to hear, and they were all very excited to keep moving forward and using whatever best practices uh, they could. And the interesting thing was, in terms, of, it says rewards and recognition up there. In terms of rewards and recognition, I think we uh, sometimes we automatically think that's monetary, or that's a plaque, or something like that. That's not what we found. That wasn't the case with the counselors, at least in these four states. It was that intrinsic value, that satisfaction they got personally and professionally from helping their customers find and maintain employment. That's the theme we heard across the board. So. And at this point, I'm turning it over to Mr. Trent. <laughs>
Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> it's great to be here. And this is the part where I would usually say, everybody come down to the front. We have this big, huge room, and somebody's all the way in the back. So uh, that's the, I guess, the budding teacher in me. I, like they said, I'm not too far away from a defense and uh, getting nervous about that, obviously. But what I want to talk today about and what I was asked to, to share with you is kind of the methodology. How did we put all this together? We have some solid background now that uh, Dr. Devalier has pointed out and shared. And so then it was kind of, at least in terms of the idea was, okay, now what do we do? How can we really direct this into a future-oriented type of an approach? They talked a lot today, this morning, about knowledge translation and getting it ready uh, and communicating it effectively with practitioners in the field. And I think that's really one of the purposes of this approach that we, and the study that we put together. In fact, I think if we kind of reworked that, that top piece there, just to say the purpose of the Delphi is it's applicable to our present study was to gain a national consens consensus on the specific practices and interventions of a panel of experts and what they considered those best practices and evidence-based practices in the state federal VR system right now to be. What, are they, what is being used? How well has it been researched and what's their, what's their perspective of those things? How well would they rate it? And, and we'll talk through the instrument and how we really tried to collect that as well. Uh, the, the Delphi, though, is just a panel of experts that are brought together to give their perception on some specific questions. In counseling, we have this miracle question. If we're going to be solution-focused, uh, we can bring in that idea of, okay, if you went to bed last night and you woke up in the morning and all of your problems were solved, what's different? What's changed? How can you articulate that to me? And in essence, I think that's kind of what we did. We had some questions that we went through. Um, I'm kind of getting out of order here. I'm going to jump up just real quick and I'll come back. These questions became very important to us in the sense of we really want to understand what is their perception. What do they believe to be those things that are, are evidence-based right now? How relevant are they? And then really build some questions around that. These were our miracle questions in a sense. And so it became very critical of the questions we asked so that we could get good feedback. Now, more important than that, we talk about sometimes you are what you eat. Well, whatever you put in is what you get out. And so we really needed a strong panel here to really put together a solid perception of what is out there. What is going on? How well has it been re researched? What's being implemented? Uh, so they had to have a knowledge of research. They had to have a knowledge of the services that are presently being used on a a very consistent basis, at least in terms of frequency. Roy talked about validity to a model. Sometimes that doesn't happen state to state. Many of you are aware with that, but the idea of consistency in terms of frequency, something that's being used on maybe in a high volume and that type of an approach. So we really needed some individuals that were familiar with VR services top to bottom and that state federal idea of uh, familiarity with kind of our, our roots if we go back to the state federal system and the legislation that brought rehab counseling about. So 35 subject matter expert, experts were identified. They were contacted via email. The, the interesting thing about a Delphi study is it's partially, uh, they, there's not a true, and we always talk about count confidentiality. These individuals, at least from researcher to participant, it's not confidential. We have to know who they are. As part of the process, we, we keep track of their responses, and we also email them back those responses at periods throughout this process so that they have their original responses and then responses that was, represents a mean and a standard deviation of the, of the entire sub panel. And so at least researcher to participant, it's not um, confidential, but participant to participant it is. They don't know the, who else is on the panel with them. And, and so they can feel free, at least in that regard, to provide what they think is a true perception according to the knowledge they have of the research, a knowledge of they have of the services that are being provided. But again, for, at least from the, the researchers to the participants, we do have to track theirs. And so what you'll see then is um, fairly balanced male to female in terms of who participated with us, the 35 subject matter experts. The other nice thing that is because it's small and it's meant to be small, it can be a little more personal. So the <laughs> <laughs> Potentially, some of you received an email from me not that long ago as I was trying to data, gather data for my dissertation. Well, this email, at least it for, from an invitation to participate standpoint, can be very personal. Uh, it's, it's a smaller group of people. 
Typically there's a relationship there because we are kind of a small field. We talk about the specialty of rehab counseling and so, hey, this is what we're, we're going to do. Would you like to participate? Would you not? And they were, they were free then to decline or uh, accept to participate at that point. So it's a little bit, I don't know if it was easier, but at least it was more personal. And so uh, a lot that had a doctoral degree, about 23 of our 35 participants, many of them also had a master's degree with 10. Academic training, rehab counseling psychology was a really big one, as well as counseling and counseling, counselor education with rehabilitation being that specialty. So people that I think um, are very aware, aware of our field, its history, how it came about, and then as you look at years of experience, five to, we did have a fairly large range, five years of service to 44 years of service, but that mean at 30 years they've been around uh, a little while, they understand how things have progressed and they've also had a chance then many of them to be very strong researchers in the field of evidence-based practice and then also work closely with state and federal systems to understand what that process is. So we felt like we had a very good representation. Again, it, it, you could kind of think it's small, but it's meant to be that way and we also felt like this was a strong representation to move forward with. And that led us to our, our miracle questions again. Tell us about those evidence-based practices that are presently being used in service delivery. Uh, the first one is what was meant as more of a definition. Now, if we look at literature, and even, sorry, in your, what we handed out was a handout. Uh, some of the things that we included to the participants are included in your, your handout. And we included in many, many, many instances of this Delphi process the levels of evidence have, that have been outlined. And so the first question was intended as a definition question. Basically, we wanted to, without asking them to define evidence-based practice, basically tell us what you think it is. So from their own perspective, what does it mean? The second question really looked at specific evidence or specific services that they feel are presently being used to um, facilitate service delivery and rehabilitation settings. So the first part, kind of define it. The second part, what are specific services? And a lot of times what we would see, especially in the definition part, would be a one word response and it would actually be a service. So kind of this idea, well, what is evidence-based practice? And then they might say individual placement and support as opposed to going through, well, it's a methodological approach, it's rigorous, it should be, that it, it, was, it was, oh, well, here's a service. And then the next question was, here's a service. So, a little bit of, of back and forth there. Now, this, there's two processes that we went through. The first one was qualitative in nature, and that was the two questions we just used. And three of the researchers would get, were, we took those responses, those qualitative responses, and independently reviewed them, looked at them and said, what are the themes, what are the codes that we see here, came back together, and, and basically then compared that with the literature, compared that amongst ourselves, the three of us. What does this look like? Do we have it wasn't necessarily that we were looking for consensus, but at least a general idea, uh, bringing closer together, should this be included, should it not? Specifically, as we were looking at services, over we had 61 services that were um, sent back to us, and that's actually, uh, we didn't give you all 61 of those, but that's how we got to the 26 that are on the handout that we gave you, is going through this process and refining it. And then once the three of us had, had come up with, okay, we think these are, are pretty good services to bring back to the, to the entire group of five that are working on this project, the other two then would say kind of an independent review. Yes, this should be included. No, it shouldn't. Uh, what does the literature say on this? And so we have a really extensive Google document where we had to justify why something should be included. And then also sometimes it was, you know what? Uh, there's kind of a gut feeling here. Maybe the evidence isn't quite as strong, but um, we should have this in there. And so that's how we ended up with the 26 items on our instrument. Uh, kind of a decision at one point to include it or not. From a definition standpoint, these were some of the definitions we saw. Um, uh, not often, especially if we look at the levels of evidence of hierarchy, do we see something that mentioned employment or an outcome of some type? But again, I think that's specific to the nature of the individuals that we serve that we have an outcome in mind. We're working towards something. It's not necessarily a restoration to health like a true medical evidence-based practice might be. But in this case, especially with this in, within the state federal VR system, very much employment driven and very much uh, an outcome driven type of, of a setting. Another thing that was kind of interesting, and it goes back to the knowledge translation that was mentioned this morning is, if you look up there with extremely inconsistent and not understood, there's this idea of, well, it's out there and maybe at least most of the, if you look, the seven individuals that identified that all came from the academic setting, not necessarily the, the state rehab setting in terms of practitioners. 
And I remember as a state rehabilitation counselor myself, there was one gentleman that worked with a mental health caseload that was consistently higher in terms of performance. And everyone always wondered, well, what is he doing so differently? How is he cheating? <laughs> It wasn't cheating. As I look back now, it was really just using an individual placement and support model very well, and then also working well with uh, his um, ACT team so that he was integrating the rehabilitation approach. He was coming at it from an evidence-based approach, and he was having better outcomes as a result of it. But as a counselor, I wasn't thinking that way. So uh, it's kind of interesting to look at and, and then think, okay, if we're going to take these things and we do the research and we have evidence that something really should really something really can impact an outcome, because that's what we're working towards, then we really do need to, to make sure that that knowledge translation occurs and, and practitioners have a chance to utilize that. Examples, um, supported employment. This is where we had the 61 different things, and these are just some of those that uh, hit back, at least with higher numbers. There was a lot of things that were, had one or two individuals that would say that of the 35. And so there was a lot of, some of those still made the list, the working alliance in terms of counseling was one that came back with at least in terms of a frequency, if that's what we want to look at, very low. I believe only one person mentioned that and yet uh, something that we think is vital to, the re to counseling and rehabilitation counseling. And so we did include that in our 26 items that we, that we went to. As we narrowed the 61 I items down to the 26 that are listed on the paper that you have. We rank, the rank ordered according to relevance on the first page. There was, we wanted to make the second and third part of this uh, quantitative part a little, very easy and user friendly for our, our panel to use. And so what we tried to build was a side by side survey in Qualtrics that had two columns, one being relevance, one being level of evidence. The one thing that we had to point out, and we wanted to make sure that they understood was that Relevance is considered one very low to five very high. Well, with level of evidence, it's actually flipped. One is now high and five is now low. So we did take that um, hierarchy of level of evidence that you have in your handout. We put that right into the top part of the, of the instrument so that they could have that as a reference and keep that in mind. The other thing that we had so that they would understand what we were doing, we built in, and this is where <laughs> I never thought I'd be a computer programmer, had to learn a little bit of coding, but if you, the participants would take their mouse and hover over the, the service on the left, then a definition would pop up. So they knew exactly what we meant. And that's the definition we pro provided you in the handout in the last two pages. So th that became a very succinct way for them to understand this is what we mean, because a lot of times, even as we were going through our services, there were multiple ways to define something, and we would narrow you know, two or three different items were actually talking about the same thing, so we would bring those together. So this helped us to do that. And then there's the level of evidence. And so as as we, whoops, as we looked at this, um, some of the things that we wanted to show, and I think that you'll see in your paperwork, uh, as Dr. Leahy talks about the results and, and mentions a lot of now what's in the paperwork that you have, level of evidence is one of those things that, especially as I think it gets back to the, the responses we had on not being well understood, that's something that's very much there. Um, some of the things that we have, you may be looking at some of those things already, like we are want to do when we get a handout in a in a presentation format like this, and you might be saying, well, wait a minute, I know that transition research is actually very much more in-depth and has a higher level of evidence than what the panel suggested. That may be true, but again, this is just an idea of where we stand, and if something is higher or lower than it's reported as, this helps to give us a direction, I think, to move forward, and I think that's where Dr. Leahy will, will take it from oh, here. Okay, great. I ran out of coffee and I'm drinking this mango stuff, so I hope it goes okay. Yeah, the, um, again, thanks Trent, but the, the, the overall focus what that we were trying to do here was really to generate a, uh, some consensus uh, from a really well-known national group uh, panel on what's the most important uh, areas in relation to both the relevance to VR and the level of evidence that is demonstrated. You know, whenever you do something like this and you're using an expert panel, that expert panel is remarkably important because they are the voice of the, the researchers and practitioners and administrators in the field. Uh, and we were very, very fortunate. We went after everybody that we really wanted on this panel. And if you looked at the names of the, the people on the panel, researchers involved with VR, administrators of agencies that are very committed to uh, promising practices and best practice, 
uh, and then we had other people from the, the more of the counseling level. Uh, it was really quite a remarkable group of people. And they, 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 doing a, a study like this, as you may know, there's many iterations to it, so they're doing constant work for you. And as, as Trent said, we also got lots of comments back from the participants that were real helpful for us to really understand what they were struggling with. Now, we started with 35. And we lost a few, and it was really interesting why we did and, and they interchanged with us. The people that we generally lost, we, I think we lost seven altogether. We had 35 to start with. We had 28 or, 28 or 26 that, that focused on the, the entire three iterations of the Delphi. Uh, but the most uh, important reason for people to drop out was they didn't feel comfortable, particularly on the research side, making the kind of judgments in relation to levels of evidence. And that was really good to hear them say that. Rather than just going ahead and, and uh, trying their best, they really shared with us their level of confidence that they had. But the other 28 felt pretty confident in most of the judgments that they made, which made us feel good relative to um, the kinds of outcomes that we're getting. So we had 28 uh, subject matter experts uh, provide data on round two, uh, and 26 of these also responded to the consensus round, round three. Uh, the mean standard deviation, and that's what you're trying to do, is lower the variance on this to see if you can gain consensus. Uh, the mean standard deviations for the relevance scale uh, went from 0.81 in round two to 0.72 in round three. And the standard deviations uh, also dropped significantly for the evidence scale, going from 1.38 to 1.02. Uh, the standard deviations in general were um, much larger in the evidence scale than for the relevance scale. And that had to do, again, what I think is an easier judgment to make relative to is something highly relevant to employment outcomes for voc rehab than what level of evidence supports that particular practice. So let's go ahead and look at these. You've got those in those handout, and what this is really just a straight ranking based on the, the means of the relevant scale. So you can see things like transition services, assistive technology, IPS, on-the-job training, demand-side employment, benefits counseling, motivational interviewing, customized employment, those all were highly relevant to uh, employment outcomes in the VR system by our panel of experts. Go ahead, one more up. And they continue all the way through, uh, but basically what we can say is there were 26 promising uh, practices, achieved an overall mean of 3.80 with a standard deviation of 0.57. So we know that we've got a real strong set of um, practices that are highly relevant to the field. Let's go on to uh, evidence. We've got a couple different things in your handouts about this, uh, but they're just different ways of looking at it. Um, we're gonna start at the bottom up. So you can see that the, the, the areas that have the lowest evidence available are things like dual customer approach, online community practice, social media, soft skills training, PCP, uh, demand side employment strategies. Those all fed in that, that four to five category. Then we had a whole number of them finish in the, let's go to the next one, between 3.0 and 3.92. And again, starting at the bottom, you've got things like customized employment, benefits counseling, community-based work programs, uh, family involvement, on-the-job training, job club, all the way up to uh, person-centered therapy uh, within that three to four range. And let's go to the next one. And finally, these are the highest rated items or practices in terms of level of evidence, and it included Working Alliance, uh, Brief Solution Focused Therapy, uh, IPS, uh, ACT, and Cognitive and Behavioral Therapy. So really, we've got a fairly big spread on the items, and only a few at the very top between two and three. Um, it's interesting because the uh, um, the ones that we we're probably most familiar with, and certainly the ones that were ranked the highest in relation to relevance to VR were also some of the ones that didn't have the high level of evidence associated with them. And so I mean, there were 13 of those promising practices, and only IPS, motivational interviewing, and working alliance received ratings of less than three, between two and three. 
The other top tier services and related to relevance, uh, really things like transition, customized employment, demand side employment, clearly these are important and highly relevant to employment goals, but because they are emerging practices, um, they were also ranked relatively low in terms of levels of evidence. Conversely, the areas of psychological and counseling services that we know so well, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, person-centered therapy, solution-focused, things like that, that are important, obviously, support services to improve self-determination, motivation, and VR, uh, were also ranked less in terms of relevance than the highest ranking contemporary practices. The psychosocial or psychosocial services have their root, as you know, in psychology, and they have generally higher levels of empirical support than some of the VR services that were created within our own industry. Now, there are several limitations to what we've done here that, that are important. One is that um, we took great care in coming up with this wonderful panel that worked with us, but again, other people and other panels might come up with slightly different kinds of results. Um, and although we were really helped, took great care in selecting the services that went into the study, uh, we could have missed some. And there, by no means are we saying this is an exhaustive list of services that are relevant to VR and have some evidentiary base. Another limitation for us would be we were all uh, folks in a university setting generally that, that ran the studies, uh, strong voc rehab background at the state level, and that almost also might have influenced how we looked at these things. But overall, I think it's, it was a very fair study. Um, it covers a wide array of services and interventions um, on various levels of evidence and application within the public rehab program. Um, the data clearly indicate that a great majority of the employment services in VR do have scientific, do not have scientific evidence to support their use. So the majority of the services that we do are really weak relative to evidence. Um, within this cluster of services, however, IPS and support employment should have actually been rated higher than they were in the study. Uh, we see that through some other research done by Gary Bond and other, other people, and that's also through of ACT. So they were actually less ranked than we thought they were, would be based on the level of evidence. So, you know, the, our good friend Fong Chan had a, had a quote many years ago where he said there's a misunderstanding among stakeholder groups in disability and rehabilitation communities that rehab counselors and state VR offices and agencies do not use empirically validated interventions to improve psychosocial health and employment outcomes for people with disabilities. To the contrary, and further validated by the present study, there are a number of services provided by rehab counselors and state VR agencies that are supported by strong scientific evidence, including best practices in counseling, skills training, and support employment. So although there were some bright spots that we found in our study, there was also some things that are continually concerning us. And those have to do with our general research focus in our profession. Uh, much, much of the research that has been conducted over the past 50 years has really been descriptive in nature. Many of these efforts were attempting to determine relationships among existing data rather than a purposeful approach to define what types of interventions or services appear to work best with what populations under what specific conditions. And that's Paul's age-old question from 1967. Clearly, this question remains a limitation in our field in, in relation to the existing research emphasis in VR. We would also very, very strongly uh, encourage more intervention-related research, and the speakers prior to this, Paul and Fong and David, also talked about that. We need more interrelation studies that really, and less studies regarding employment and other related outcomes that are just ad hoc relationship-related. So we really need to be focused on, on very actively engaging with the community of scholars and of those people in practice. And that's one of the things that we've noticed over time in terms of this gap. And part of that gap that, that we're aware of, it's the theme of the conference, uh, relates to research that's not being utilized at the practice level. 
in our field has been really quite innovative in terms of developing ways of trying to get information to practitioners over the many years. Lots of different ways have been attempted. But I think that misses the problem. Because I think the problem is that the research community is not close enough to the field to really understand what counselors are looking for relative to research that really would inform best practice. So I'm very, very strongly recommending that, that our research groups really get engaged in the field, work directly with practitioners and other stakeholders to design studies that really do have an impact on practice. So we need to include other things when we write articles about research, uh, particularly so that they can be used in, in any kind of data meta-analysis. Uh, data such as effect size, confidence intervals need to be routinely reported in research articles to maximize our ability to use those to come up with some conclusions relative to strength of evidence. And in order to meaningfully uh, address this issue of knowledge translation, we need more replication and extension of research so that we really have rigorous, coherent lines of research supporting the practices that we have. Now, obviously, there's a concern here for some of the limitations that we have in our own field, um, and we're probably not equipped in many senses to do the gold standard relative to the hierarchy, but regardless, we can, we can gather important information that'll give consumers and counselors real confidence that the interventions that they're exploring for potential use have some background and some uh, validity to them. Now, so in summary, the Delphi process has uh, done well in terms of national experts looking at our research and, uh, and identifying interventions that are both relevant and some evidentiary base to them. But finally, I want to talk a little bit about uh, some other things that we need to concern ourselves with at a real primary level. And one of those is the working alliance. Uh, one of the people that uh, uh, has done a lot of work on this obviously is Wampold, uh, where he's indicated that the working alliance, uh, along with other counselor effects, is one of the strongest validated factors influencing counseling outcomes. In a recent interview, and I think it was in a Wisconsin um, magazine, I read that he had some other things to say that were really interesting to me. He said, what really makes a difference is not which treatment is delivered, but the skill in which the treatment is provided. You can't deliver some magic ingredient that is going to make patients better or clients better. What makes the difference is how a skilled therapist or counselor and the collaborative process of client and therapist work together. Now, our research team would, would absolutely endorse that 100%. Um, completely agree with that perspective and the notion that it's insufficient to focus our interest on evidence-based practice without the primary consideration to the knowledge and skill of the rehabilitation counselor and the relationship between the counselor and consumer that leads to successful outcomes. So with that, I think we're right at the end here. Um, just to wrap up, this is a, a, an important study but a first step. Uh, it was the first time we've gotten a group of national experts to look at these practices and to talk to us about how relevant they are and importantly to our, our, our particular main thrust of the research, how much evidence really supports these practices um, at the present time. So in one way it gets us started to be able to talk more uh, specifically about services and, and interventions. Uh, and particularly their, the level of evidence associated with them, but it's also a call to move forward. We really have to, like we said, do more intervention studies, find ways of really collecting this information so that counselors can really utilize this in practice. I mean, that's one of the real challenges, I think, is coming up with ways in which counselors can access information in a very timely and efficient way given their caseloads. So it'll help inform that, that relationship and the decisions they make about what interventions they select. Um, currently, we're at the beginning of that process, but we've made some really good strides over the last, I'd say, five or six years. And hopefully this next decade will really be a time when we really gather more and more information that assists the counselor and the client in making the right kinds of decisions. So thank you for being here today. I think I got us out right in time. Uh, any questions or any comments before we wrap up? Okay, thank you everybody.
Have a good lunch.